Welcome to another Triathlon Training Explained. Today, I'm gonna to be investigating the truth behind the phrase, use it or lose it. Just how quickly does our body lose fitness when we stop training? Well, I'm going to be delving into the physiology behind detraining and also looking at what happens to our bodies when we return to training. And I'll let you know now, I've actually got some encouraging news. When you are forced to reduce or stop your training, it can be a slightly nerve-wracking waiting game. A, to find out how long you're going to be off, and B, to find out just what that damage is to your performance when you come out the other end. Obviously, the shorter the time off, then the quicker you'll be able to get back. But there's still so many other factors that come into the equation of just how much fitness and how quickly you will lose it. For example, we've got age. Yes, I'm afraid the younger you are, the quicker you'll be able to return and the less fitness that you will lose. But then we've got things such as training history. So if you've been doing that sport for years, you're gonna lose it quicker and you'll be able to get back quicker compared to someone who say, has only been doing sport for a few months. And then we've got current activity. So it depends what you're able to do during that period of being off. So whether you can do anything that's specific to your sport as that will all obviously help. We've got your fitness before you had that time off, obviously the fitter you are, then you've got much a longer window before you're gonna be back to pretty much ground zero. And finally, there's genetics. Yes, I'm afraid some people will lose fitness quicker than others. We might not be able to determine the exact rate of fitness loss, but we do know what's happening at a physiological level. Now to get the science low down, I spoke to exercise physiologist Dan Plews and asked him to explain exactly what's happening to our bodies when we have some time off training. So I guess there's a few things that happen and I'll go through them in the order. One of the first things that happens is we do get a dramatic reduction in our blood blood volume. So, and that's why typically if you have a rest day, you'll always find that heart rate's a little bit higher because the heart rate's counterbalancing that dropping cardiac output and that dropping stroke volume. So you're having a higher heart rate. So at submaximal levels, heart rate's that little bit higher. Um, and then also what really happens is one of the major things is substrate utilization. So you actually start burning more carbohydrates than you would fat normally. So that's another major one to start to happen. So that's, and I find that's quite interesting. So if you have a, a long time off, you'll find that you could, you know, for the dreaded bonk, or you might hit the wall during those long rides much more easily. Um, and then you're looking at more of those structural changes. So that might be decreased capillarization of the muscle, for example. And then really, really long term, if you're talking more than four weeks, so months and months, um, you're looking at actual decreases in size of the heart, which is obviously much more, much more difficult to get back. So that's why, you know, in the off season, we try to keep athletes only having an off season of three to four weeks and we don't really want to go any more than that because some of those structural changes can happen. It's not all doom and gloom, however. You can actually reduce that fitness loss quite dramatically. Now, I found some research that showed by doing 20% of your normal training volume, you can actually reduce your fitness loss by as much as half compared to if you did nothing. Obviously, this does depend on the specificity of that training that you're doing and just what your fitness goals are, but I find it quite encouraging. And I went back to Dan to ask him to explain a little bit more and just tell us how exactly we can limit that fitness loss. If you've got a period of time where you actually, for example, right now, you, you might not be able to do any training as you should, the best way to do it and to minimize those reductions, because those reductions will happen, is to do shorter bouts of high intensity. And the reason being, so a, a really good session would be something like eight by 30, minute, uh, 30 seconds, full out maximal reps with about one minute recovery. And the reason these seem to be the best is because you're pulling and drawing on many aspects of your physiology. So even though they're highly glycolytic, so anaerobic dependent, if you're doing 30 seconds exercise, you're actually getting a really massive aerobic benefit as well because the recovery aspect of that is still giving you that part of it. So if you look at some of the research in like interval training, where people have done intervals training that would be, be presumed to be purely glycolytic, they're having mostly aerobic adaptation. So that's the reason why is that you're kind of getting a mirage of every single little bit of um, requirement of your physiology into one session. So if you did eight by 30, eight by 30 seconds on one minute off three times a week, you can be sure that that will be a really minimize that reduction. How much, um, who knows, but that's, um, but that's kind of the guidelines is that you really want to go for the short and short and high intensity stuff rather than the long duration. And what about any strength work? Is that really important to sort of try and get in to reduce that, the loss of muscle or the loss of strength? 
Yeah, well, well, loss of muscle is a, is an interesting one. If you I mean muscle waste is waste really really quick for sure, but not really if you're generally using it. So you'll see someone in a cast when they're not using their arm or the leg at all. You know, they'll take the cast off and the cast will be mass. You know, the muscle is massively reduced. But if you're using it in some kind of day to day, doesn't really happen that much. And so because the rate of decline is a lot slower in. The, the strength you generally don't lose as much so it means that it doesn't take that much to pop it back up um, and a lot of the strength um, lot, lots of the first adaptations that you see in strength are not so much the loss of um, actual cross-sectional fiber size which is you know which is really important for strength a lot of it is just the loss of neuromuscular and the motor recruitment which is one of the first things to come back so it's not so much to worry about so especially in triathlon you know it's not especially if you talk about long distance triathlon, we're doing a sport that doesn't require us to be really, really strong. Usually we're strong enough for the requirements of the, of, of the sport that we do. So it's not really something that I would be massively, massively concerned about for sure. Well, hopefully you were as pleasantly surprised as I was, and I told you, it's not as bad as you might have first thought. Anyway, I think we've covered fitness loss in enough detail now. It's time to start looking ahead and seeing what happens when we actually start to return to our normal training. So I went back to Dan to ask him to explain which elements of our fitness will return first and what our trajectory is likely to look like. So um, what, what generally comes back first is you'll generally find the strength comes back quite easily because generally, you know, triathletes, especially in endurance sport, we're not actually massively physically strong anyway. So we are, our requirements aren't that big and also the rate of loss isn't, isn't as high. So we're losing less and we don't have as far to go. On the endurance side, that does take a little bit longer. And this isn't from any um, scientific literature, but just talking to a lot of coaches, generally the rule is that if you have three weeks off, it takes six weeks to get back. If you have four weeks off, it's eight weeks to get back. So you're kind of doubling it to when you're back to where you were before. Um, and just to use a bit of a like a coaching analogy that a coach once told me is it's it's not that hard to get back. It's a bit like a snow plow is that if you imagine that, you know, you're pushing snow and the snow is building up on the other side of the snow plow and it gets harder and harder to push it back. But when you take your foot off the gas and you stop training, some snow will fall and you can shoot back up to the, the line pretty quick. But as soon as you get there again, obviously it's much, much harder to push. And I, I quite I quite like that analogy because it isn't that it isn't as hard to think as you would believe to get back to where you were. Um, but yeah, the first thing to come back is some of those blood plasma volume changes and obviously it's kind of the reverse. So the things that take the longest to go, take the longest to get back. So if you're thinking about um, changes in blood plasma volume and blood volume in general, that will come back quite quick. But some of those structural changes, so bringing back your polarization, if you've lost any structural changes of the heart, obviously they're going to take a long time to get back as well. So it's if the way it it falls away is also the how how it comes back so what goes the fastest comes back the fastest and what goes the longest it takes the longest to go away another thing that i think on the return is what people make a big mistake of is they forget that they're um you know that they've changed and i think being re reassessing yourself getting you know, if, you, if you're measuring your FTP or whatever your training zones are, get a new marker of what that might be because um, what we know about injury risk and things like this is that injury risk is at its highest when you have a break from exercise. So that point of time when you've just started exercise, you're at your highest level of injury risk. So you have to make sure that it's a progressive and you're not going back and trying to run speeds, powers or whatever it might be that you did before. I think that's a really important thing, thing to remember. I'm sure it came as no surprise that doing some sort of exercise or training is always going to be better than nothing. However, whatever you do over the next few weeks, you are not going to lose all your fitness and return to zero. So don't worry, all that previous hard work has not gone to waste. It's just a matter of trying to limit that damage and then being able to be ready to speed up your return when you are back to training. So prioritize the type of fitness that you do want to maintain and then any exercise or training you do, make it specific to what Towards that goal and ultimately just make sure that you are able to stay healthy so when you can return to training you'll be in the best shape to do so so stay safe give this video a like if you've enjoyed it and check out our social media channels and give them a follow